Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into the next Napoleon's Marshals video. Let's get into it. 9. Marshal Bessières Jean-Baptiste Be Man, what a quote. Bessières was the son of a surgeon, with a relatively prosperous upbringing in southwestern France. When the French Revolution began, he volunteered for the National Guard, and was sent to Paris to join the King's Constitutional Guard, along with his old school friend, Georges Murat. This unit was soon disbanded, but Bessières remained in Paris, and was among the soldiers defending the Tuileries Palace when it was stormed by the mob on the 10th of August 1792. Wow! In the aftermath, he needed to get out of Paris in a hurry, Yes, he absolutely needed to get out of Paris in a hurry. So he volunteered to fight on the Pyrenees front. His bravery and good sense won him a commission in the 22nd Chasseurs, and he distinguished himself at the Battle of Boulou. Transferred to Italy, his friendship with Murat got him noticed by the army commander, General Bonaparte, who was impressed enough to make him commander of his new bodyguard, known as Les Guides de Bonaparte. Bessières distinguished himself as a cavalry commander in Italy, and later Egypt, winning promotion to brigadier, and loyally supporting Napoleon at every turn. He became one of the few men that Napoleon regarded as a true friend. When Napoleon became first consul of France in 1799, he rewarded Bessières with command of the elite consular guard cavalry which he led with devastating effect at Marengo the next year. In 1804, Bessières became a marshal, less for any great military achievement than for being a loyal member of Napoleon's inner circle. Bessières himself was well-liked, kind, well-mannered and generous, a pious Catholic and social conservative, who liked to powder his hair in the old style. His young wife, Marie-Jeanne, was also a favourite at court, doted on by Napoleon and Empress Josephine. In 1805, Bessières commanded the Imperial Guard. In December that year, at the Battle of Austerlitz, he played a crucial role repelling the Russian Guard at the battle's climax. At Eylau in 1807, his squadron supported Murat's mass cavalry charge, and made their own disciplined attacks to cover his withdrawal. However, Bessières' opportunities for glory were limited. Napoleon always held the guard back as his last reserve, as at Friedland. Yeah, we had this back and forth conversation about him not using the guard in Russia, where he might have been able to actually wipe the, the Russian army out. But that's his... You know, that's his last card. That's Napoleon's last card, so he likes to hang on to it as much as he can. In 1808, Bessières received his first major independent command in northern Spain. Oh, great. That May, the country erupted in revolt against the French. Bessières reacted quickly and decisively, securing key towns and roads. He then attacked Spanish forces at Medina de Rio Seco winning a crushing victory against an enemy that outnumbered him two to one. But once the immediate crisis had passed, he hesitated and failed to exploit his victory. When Napoleon arrived in Spain, Bessières was given command of the Reserve Cavalry, a role he retained for the war against Austria in 1809. In May, Bessières and his cavalry were among the first across the Danube, with Massena occupying the village of Aspern on his left, and Lann holding Essling on the right. When the Austrian commander, Archduke Charles, launched a massive and unexpected counterattack, Bessières, outnumbered four to one, made a series of desperate charges, helping to save the army from disaster. It came at a high cost. Bessières and his cavalry performed bravely, but that night, a long-running feud with Marshal Lann nearly came to blows when Lann accused Bessières of hanging back. The matter went no further, as Lann was fatally wounded the next day. 
that is one of the interesting parts of this is how much butting of head you have between the marshals. Um, it said that he was close with uh, Murat and he didn't like Lan. Is there anybody else that he butted heads with that he didn't like? I feel like all of the marshals essentially hate all of the other marshals. I know there's a few that like each other, but man, they seem to not like a lot of them. Bessier commanded the cavalry again at Wagram, leading a major attack to cover Massena's redeployment to the left wing. As the charge began, a cannonball killed Bessier's horse and injured his leg. A rumour reached the Imperial Guard that Bessier was dead. Some old veterans began to weep for their old commander, until they were assured he was only wounded. That was quite a cannonball, Napoleon told Bessier. It reduced my guard to tears. As a devout Catholic, Bessier was critical of Napoleon's divorce from Empress Josephine, leading to a short spell out of favour. In 1811, he was sent back to Spain to command the Army of the North. He found a Man, he's getting real lucky with all these deployments to Spain, since everybody else seems to do real well down here. An impossible situation. A widespread insurgency and insufficient troops and supplies. He wrote bluntly to Napoleon, stating that the French must give up territory, something the Emperor would never allow. For all his piety and refined manners, Bessières ordered his share of executions and reprisals in his attempt to pacify northern Spain. Brutal methods used by many French commanders in this conflict. Later that year, he joined forces with Marshal Massena's Army of Portugal to take on Wellington's army at the Battle of Fuentes de Onoro, but was widely blamed for refusing to send in his cavalry to support Massena's attacks. Unfortunately for Napoleon, this was typical of how many marshals behaved in his absence. They'd rather watch another marshal fail than help them to win all the glory. In eight yeah, that's what I was talking about. They just, the relationships between the marshals, it's so untenable in some situations that it makes me wonder if Napoleon wasn't doing it on purpose. Like that he wasn't purposefully putting people in there who would kind of fight and bicker and he be able to be like the the final call you know um i don't know but they the marshals certainly didn't get along 1812 bessier accompanied napoleon into russia commanding his guard cavalry since the guard was kept in reserve he saw little action until the retreat when he led the advance guard clearing a path for the survivors the disaster in Russia left Bessier severely demoralized, but he was resolved to do his duty, now serving once more as Napoleon's cavalry commander, in Marshal Murat's absence. On the 1st of May 1813, Bessier was scouting enemy positions before the Battle of Lützen, when a cannonball hit him in the chest, killing him instantly. His death robbed Napoleon of a dependable commander and one of his last remaining friends. It is surely a great loss for you and your children, Napoleon wrote to his widow, but an even greater one for me. Ooh, I feel like that's kind of a dick move. Like, yeah, I know that y'all are, you know, you lost your husband and the father to your children, but he was my friend too. Eight, Marshal MacDonald. Jacques MacDonald's father was a Scotsman who'd supported Bonnie Prince Charlie's bid to seize the British throne in 1745. After this ended in defeat at Culloden, the family fled to France. Inspired by tales of the Trojan War, MacDonald chose a military life and became a lieutenant in Dillon's Irish Regiment, a French unit made up mostly of Irish émigrés. In the Revolutionary Wars, he won a reputation as a hard-working, intelligent and brave officer, and served as aide-de-camp to General Maurier, commanding the Army of the North. 
He distinguished himself in that general's famous victory at Jemappe, paving the way for rapid promotion from lieutenant to general in just two years. He led his division well during campaigns in Holland and Germany, and formed a close bond with one of France's most successful commanders of this period, General Moreau. Was, was that common? The Irish regiment, was that common to have different immigrants, different ethnicities that had come from other places make up their own group? within the military like is that something that france did a lot of at you know now they have like the french foreign legions is is that something they commonly did or was there just a mass influx of irish people all at once and so they that's why they did it in 1798 he was sent to rome as governor and later commanded the army of naples Summoned north the following year to reinforce Moreau's Army of Italy, he was nearly killed in a skirmish with Austrian cavalry, and while still suffering from his wounds, his army was defeated at the Trebia by a larger coalition force commanded by the great Russian general Suvorov. But Macdonald's own conduct won approval from General Bonaparte, among others. Later that year, he assisted Napoleon's seizure of power in the coup of 18 Brumaire, ensuring the loyalty of the troops at Versailles. He was rewarded with an army command in Switzerland, and that winter led his men through the Alps to attack the Austrians in Italy. Wait, what exactly did he do for the coup? Where did he just like hand allegiance over so everybody under him? also handed allegiance over, you know, like, if he's the, the general or commander of a group of men, him handing his allegiance is signing over all of his men too. Is that what he did? What's, what role did he play in helping the coup? His march was far more challenging and dangerous than Napoleon's, but was never immortalized in quite the same way. <laughs> In 1804, Macdonald's former commander, General Moreau, was arrested and charged with involvement in a plot to assassinate Napoleon. Macdonald stood up for his friend's reputation, an act of loyalty typical of the man, but disastrous for his career. Moreau was exiled, Macdonald was placed under police surveillance and retired to his country estate in disgrace. Jeez. Five years passed before Napoleon, desperate for experienced senior commanders, asked him to serve as military advisor to his 27-year-old stepson, Prince Eugène, now commanding the Army of Italy. Macdonald and Eugène worked well together, driving back the Austrians, and by an awesome feat of marching, joined Napoleon near Vienna, in time for the Battle of Wagram. The second day of the battle was Macdonald's moment. Entrusted by the Emperor with the main attack on the enemy centre, he formed his troops into a giant, open-backed square, and advanced into a hail of fire. Napoleon, watching through his telescope, exclaimed several times, What a brave man! What a brave man! Macdonald's costly attack helped to secure a great victory. The next day, Napoleon went to find him on the battlefield, and greeted him with the words, Let us be friends from now. You have acted valiantly and given me the greatest services. On the battlefield of your glory, where I owe you so large a part of yesterday's success, I make you a Marshal of France. You have long deserved it. Jeez. So that was a quick come up. He was ostracized basically, got out of Dodge, was retired and, and off the grid basically. He gets asked to come back and then he comes back and does awesome, helps win Wagram, and then gets made a marshal right after that, right after his huge moment in the battle. That is a, a quick <laughs> turn of events. In addition, Macdonald received the title Duke of Taranto 
and a large pension. But as time would prove, his loyalty remained to France, not to Napoleon. Macdonald spent an unhappy year in Catalonia, commanding troops in what he regarded as an immoral war. In his memoirs, he even praised the noble and courageous resistance of the Spanish. Wow. Wow, so he doesn't agree with the war in Spain. That's very interesting. In 1812, he was given command of 10th Corps for the invasion of Russia. This corps, composed of German troops and reluctant Prussian allies, guarded the left flank of the invasion and had a It makes me laugh every time I hear, you know, the marshals are in Spain, they're struggling, they're struggling, and then like, oh, thank God, we finally get to get out of Spain, and then they, they're going right into Russia. Like, eh, you're going to wish you were back in Spain. The relatively quiet campaign. In December, the Prussians suddenly agreed an armistice with the Russians, leaving the loyal remnants of Macdonald's corps to fight their way back to Poland. By 1813, Napoleon relied on Macdonald as one of his senior marshals. In August, he gave him command of the forces keeping watch on General Blücher's army of Silesia. But when Macdonald advanced across the Katzbach River, torrential rain and flooding caused chaos among his troops, just as they encountered Blücher's army. Blücher launched an immediate attack, and Macdonald's army was routed. Imagine that. Blücher launched an immediate attack. Who would have saw that coming? Thousands of his new conscripts surrendered or deserted. Hundreds were driven into the river itself. Macdonald took full responsibility for the disaster, though his lack of cavalry and some bad luck were also to blame. Napoleon certainly continued to respect Macdonald's military judgment. He continued to command 11th Corps and was in the thick of the fighting at Leipzig two months later. Macdonald was with the rear guard when the French retreat began and was shocked to see the chaos that engulfed the army. When the Elster Bridge was blown too early, he himself was trapped on the wrong side of the river and just managed to swim to safety under enemy fire. Macdonald continued to serve Napoleon as a loyal and reliable commander throughout the 1814 campaign, effectively serving as his deputy at several key moments. Unlike most marshals, Macdonald was never under Napoleon's spell and always spoke his mind to the Emperor. This in itself was a valuable service, though it sometimes led to heated arguments. Yeah, but you need that. You need that pushback, especially from military commanders. Like, that is what will make things successful. If you don't have that, you're, you're going to get caught up in your own thoughts and ideas. You're not, you can't always be right. Perhaps inevitably, in April, it was Macdonald and Ney who took the lead in confronting Napoleon with the facts of his situation. The war was lost, and he must abdicate. Napoleon named Macdonald as one of the three men who would negotiate with the Allies, telling his foreign minister, the Marquis de Colincourt, Macdonald does not like me, but he is a man of his word, of high principles, and he can be relied on. In their last meeting, a few days later, Napoleon told Macdonald, I did not know you well. I was prejudiced against you. I have done so much for so many others who have abandoned me. And you, who owe me nothing, have remained faithful. I appreciate your loyalty. Too late. Yeah, this is a very interesting relationship and back and forth. It's very different than most of the other marshals. It's, it's, you know, Napoleon obviously likes people to follow his orders. That's kind of a big deal to him. But, like I said, you need that pushback. You need people who aren't afraid to voice opposition. This whole thing is just a very interesting back and forth. Did, did McDonald like Napoleon or did he not? I'm, I'm curious about that. Macdonald was kept on as a military advisor by France's restored Bourbon monarchy, 
he continued to speak his mind, so much so that Louis XVIII nicknamed him his outspokenness. During the Hundred Days, Macdonald remained loyal to the King, and attempted to rally troops to fight against Napoleon. When he saw this was futile, he escorted the King to safety in Belgium, then returned to Paris, where he refused to meet with Napoleon. After the defeat at Waterloo, he was put in charge of demobilising the last elements of Napoleon's Grande Armée, and helped many officers to escape arrest by the Bourbons. Macdonald was a methodical, reliable if unspectacular commander. But he distinguished himself above all by his lack of vanity or personal ambition, his complete loyalty to France, and his willingness to speak his mind, virtues that were all too rare among Napoleon's marshals. That really does set him apart. It makes him seem drastically different, especially the, the lack of personal ambition. Seven, Marshal Massena. André Massena was born in Nice, at that time not technically part of France, but of the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. His father, a shopkeeper, died when he was young, so he ran away to sea, then at 17 enlisted in the French army. He was quickly made a sergeant, but a commoner could rise no higher in the Royal Army, so after 14 years service he quit. Yeah, we talk about this in the comments of the last couple of videos, but the French Revolution really, really does a lot to help almost all of these guys rise to the positions that they eventually got to. It, it did a couple of things all at once. There was a big flood out of the old officers under the Bourbon mar monarchy, but also you had this ceiling that you could not break through if you weren't of a, a certain level in the oligarchy, right? And a lot of these guys weren't up to that level, so they were never going to get through that ceiling until the revolution came. And then they all rose very quickly in, in a lot of cases. When the French Revolution began, he re-enlisted in a local volunteer battalion. Massena, supremely self-confident and unfazed by any challenge, was elected to command the battalion, and led it with success against the Austrians on the Piedmontese front. Despite his lack of education, he proved an instinctive combat leader. He was soon promoted to brigadier, and after leading a successful attack at the Siege of Toulon, was made General of Division. He won an impressive victory over the Austrians at Loano in 1795, and when the Army of Italy's commander, General Scherer, resigned over lack of support from the government in Paris, many expected Massena to replace him. Instead, the job went to the 26-year-old General Bonaparte, 11 years younger and much less experienced than Massena, but with far better political connections. Nevertheless, Napoleon and Massena worked together brilliantly. Massena commanded his advance guard, and played a major role in several of his early victories. That's another one of the super interesting parts of this, is how many of the marshals were there at the very beginning of Napoleon's rise, and how many of them, like, could have taken Napoleon's place. Like... How many of them were kind of in the same <clears throat> in the same position, on the same trajectory, and just little things here or there could have placed one of a handful of these guys in the place Napoleon was in? In reports, Napoleon described Massena as active, tireless, audacious. He won so many battles that Napoleon acclaimed him l'enfant gâté de la victoire the spoiled child of victory. Massena was, however, notorious for extorting vast sums from the local Italians, often while his own troops went hungry and without pay. In 1798, Massena received his first independent command, the Army of Switzerland. The next spring, after French defeats on the Rhine, and in Italy, 
responsibility for the defence of France lay in his hands. Rather than wait to be encircled, he attacked, and won a brilliant victory over Austrian and Russian forces at the Battle of Zurich. Rewarded with command of the Army of Italy, Massena led a heroic defence of Genoa in 1800. He was eventually starved into surrender, but his stubborn defence bought Napoleon enough time to cross the Alps and defeat the Austrians at Marengo. Physically exhausted by this last ordeal, and surrounded by accusations of corruption, Massena was recalled to Paris and went into semi-retirement. Yeah, how did that work? Like, him being so known, I guess, for taking money from locals when the men aren't getting paid and are going hungry and all that. Like, how exactly did that work? What, what did the soldiers think about it? How was he publicly known? Like, what was his reputation at this time? Was it just greed? Or, like, what was that? When he was made a marshal by Napoleon in 1804, he seemed distinctly underwhelmed, and on being congratulated, remarked, there are 14 of us. <laughs> but Massena was one of the few marshals who'd proved themselves in independent command, making him a priceless asset to Napoleon. In 1805, he was recalled to active service, and given command of the Army of Italy in the war against the Third Coalition. Massena kept Archduke Charles's army busy in Italy, while the Emperor won his great victories at Ulm and Austerlitz. In 1806, Massena oversaw the occupation of the Kingdom of Naples, ordering brutal reprisals against local resistance. In 1807, he commanded V Corps in Poland, but his role covering Warsaw meant he missed the major battles of Eylau and Friedland. Later that year, while out hunting with the Emperor and his entourage at Fontainebleau, he was accidentally shot in the face and lost the use of an eye. Jesus. Napoleon, a notoriously bad shot, was to blame, but the loyal Marshal Berthier claimed responsibility. The war against Austria in 1809 saw Massena back near his best. His corps formed the vanguard for the crossing of the Danube, and fought ferociously to hold the village of Aspern against an overwhelming Austrian onslaught. Yeah, we talked about this in that video, but this is a super dangerous situation that Napoleon's in, because he really has nowhere to go. He's backed up right against the river, and so it's, it's just a very dangerous situation. We saw a coalition army get wiped out in very much, you know, a similar situation to this. And it's also... How many marshals could actually handle independent command? Because I feel like there were not, not very many of them. I, like, I feel like in almost all of these videos, the marshals are right next to Napoleon in whatever they're doing. This is the first one I can remember off the top of my head, although I may have missed one, where he's actually off doing something totally different than what Napoleon's main force is doing. Massena was everywhere, displaying his usual coolness under fire, and when ordered to retreat, ensured his troops pulled back across the river in good order. The battle was a defeat, but Massena had been superb. Together, he and the Emperor oversaw preparations for the next attempt to cross the Danube six weeks later. The Austrians were waiting for them, at the Battle of Wagram. Because of a riding accident a few days earlier, Massena had to command his corps from a carriage. He made a fine target for Austrian gunners, but was still able to organise a complex redeployment of his corps at the height of the battle, covered by Marshal Bessières' cavalry charge. Massena's bold manoeuvre secured the French left flank and won further praise from Napoleon. Massena, already ennobled as the Duke of Rivoli, received a new title, Prince of Essling, and another less welcome reward, Command of French Forces for the Invasion of Portugal. <laughs> Massena was deeply reluctant. 
Great. Yeah. Been doing real well up here with you guys. Let's go down to Spade. See how it goes. Turned to go and complain bitterly about his appointment. He was showing clear signs of exhaustion and was plagued by rheumatism and bad lungs. When he arrived in Spain, General Foy observed, He's only 52, but he looks more than 60. He's lost weight and has begun to stoop. His glance, since the accident in which he lost an eye, has lost its keenness. His subordinates, already underwhelmed by his appearance, were outraged that the Marshal also decided to bring along his mistress, poorly disguised as an officer of dragoons. The French invasion of Portugal proved a disaster. Undone by Wellington's scorched earth tactics, a hostile population and terrain, and Massena's own lethargic leadership. His corps commanders, especially Marshal Ney, were scathing of his conduct. At Busaco, Massena squandered lives with an unnecessary frontal attack on a strong British position. When he reached Lisbon, he found the city protected by new fortifications. The Again, I mentioned this in this in the video originally, but this was such a smart move by the British to make this their their last stand toehold, so that if they got pushed back, they would have a place like this to fall back to. The impregnable lines of Torres Vedras. Massena waited outside Lisbon for reinforcements that never came while sickness and guerrilla raids took their toll on his army. Five months later, he recrossed the mountains back into Spain, leaving a string of devastated villages behind him. The next summer, at Fuentes de Oñoro, Massena attacked Wellington's army once more, and despite much hard fighting, again failed to win a clear victory. He blamed Marshal Bessier for his lack of support. But the Emperor's patience was at an end. He sent Marshal Marmont to replace Massena, and when they next met, greeted him with the cutting words, So, Prince of Essling, you are no longer Massena. Yeah. Massena's health was now in steep decline. He never held a major command again, though he was recalled in 1813 to supervise a military district in southern France. He died after a long illness, in 1817. In his prime, Massena was a superb commander, incisive and dangerous, but he was past his best by the time he became a marshal. Nevertheless, there were enough sparks of his old brilliance to worry his adversaries. The Duke of Wellington once remarked, when Massena was opposed to me in the field, I never slept comfortably. Bessier, Macdonald, Massena. 20 down, 6 to go. Join us for the next part of Napoleon's Marshals as we reveal our top 6, coming soon. Okay, so that was the next Napoleon's Marshals video. I'll get to the next one tomorrow. Like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you guys then.